Protesters are demanding to be heard. All day long, and at all hours of the night, those with the so-called Freedom Convoy say they're staying put. This has been nothing but, but like dis disruptive. Like they're using, they're claiming their freedom. Well, I can't even like hear anything. Like, can't even hear myself. There is an ongoing demonstration in Canada involving uh, truckers and other protesters who uh, feel the need to impede access to the biggest international crossing in North America. Uh, they've been doing this repeatedly while also escalating tensions with uh, locals in the community who happen to want to wear masks during a global pandemic. Now, uh, this problem has only grown uh, and the demonstrations are now spreading to other countries as well. And this is not about working conditions, this is not about wages, this is not about pensions. This is specifically about people who don't want to get vaccinated, who don't want to follow safety precautions during an ongoing pandemic. And while I'm certainly empathetic to those who are feeling fatigued in regard to this coronavirus pandemic, there's also the need to ensure that we're not only protecting ourselves, protecting our communities, because this is a contagious virus. And as we've experienced with multiple COVID spikes, unvaccinated individuals end up filling hospital beds and as a result, hospitals end up turning others with other ailments away. It is a public health concern, but not for these individuals. Now, keep in mind that Canada is doing a lot better than the United States in regard to vaccinations. Over 80% of Canadians are, are, are vaccinated, right? In the United States, the number's lower, unfortunately. However, for those who don't wanna get vaccinated, including these truckers, uh, they're trying to make a point and they're doing it in, um, in pretty vicious ways, including honking their horns simultaneously. So uh, people living in communities like Ottawa, for instance, are unable to sleep. Now in Ottawa on Tuesday, for instance, uh, several hundred trucks continue to paralyze the city center. But the nonstop honking of previous days appear to have subsided. Reports on local radio in Ottawa said residents were able to keep undisturbed or sleep undisturbed for the first time in over a week. But many businesses have been shuttered during the protests, losing tens of millions of dollars. That's because these truckers are blocking the roads, which is of course terrible for the businesses. Also pretty terrible for people who are trying to get to the hospital, any type of emergency vehicle. So something to think about, but apparently uh, the health and safety of others isn't something that these individuals seem to care too much about. Now, uh, the protest has been spreading uh, and now there is some organizing happening in the United States to encourage people to engage in their own blockade. While smaller, uh, while smaller than the protests that have buffeted the core of Ottawa, Canada's capital, the new protest targets the ambassador's bridge to Detroit. The bridge is a vital link for the automobile industry, which relies on a constant shuttling of parts and components across the border to keep factories humming in Ontario and the Midwestern United States. So that's of course gonna hurt auto workers here in the United States. It'll also hurt anyone who's looking to purchase a vehicle. Prices were already inflated and incredibly high and the problem is only gonna be exacerbated by this. More than 40,000 commuters, by the way, commuters, tourists and truck drivers cross the Ambassador Bridge each day. Flavio Volp, the president of the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association, Association, a Canadian trade group, said that about $300 million in goods cross the bridge daily, with about 100 million of that related to the auto industry. And unfortunately, police have had a very difficult time keeping control of this situation. I just want to go to this video where police explain just how dire this situation really has been. Ottawa police say they have learned much in the past week, especially after reports of assaults, intimidation, and allegations of hate speech and symbols. Our goal is to end the demonstration. To try and do that, they have called in more reinforcements, moving to what they call a surge and contain strategy. But the police chief warns. This remains, as it was from the beginning, an increasingly volatile, an increasingly dangerous demonstration. And it is spreading 
like a contagion itself right across the country. A handful of protests now, including a border blockade between Alberta and Montana. And now Canada's largest city, Toronto, closing a large section in front of the provincial legislature this weekend as truckers descend. And more worrying, closing off the adjacent hospital row, where exhausted healthcare workers carry on battling COVID. And so people living in the community are frustrated. Many Ottawa residents, for instance, feel terrorized in their own homes and are angry that protesters were allowed to settle in. Blocking streets surrounding their ear splitting horns or sounding their ear splitting horns in the middle of the night and in some cases intimidating residents for things like wearing masks. Because you know, these people are totally for freedom and they just they just want to encroach on your freedom to wear a mask just to keep yourself and others safe during this pandemic. Joining us now is a resident of Canada and also a good friend of the show, David Dole. He is the host and founder of The Rational National and I'm very happy to invite him on the show right now. So David, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk a little bit about the you know, the people behind the scenes that are supporting this, funding this and encouraging this, because I think that there is this misconception in regard to, oh, well, this is a worker strike and these are people who are really standing up for themselves. Uh, but this couldn't be further than the truth. This definitely has a right wing bent to it. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and it, it's important to separate the people that think they're supporting this because they're supporting the truckers versus what this convoy actually is. So first of all, to be clear, about 90% of truckers are vaccinated. They support the mandates, the mass major, as the vast majority of people in Canada support vax mandates for hospital workers, for people that work in schools. So that aspect of it is definitely a, a fringe of individuals. But on top of that, what's important to point out is what they are not discussing. So this convoy, while claiming to stand up for the working class, 17% of federally regulated employees work in trucking, yet they make up about 80% of labor standards violations between 20, uh, 2006 and 2018, which includes things like wage theft, like uh, misclassifying employees as contractors to skirt regulators. So these are actual working class issues that could be raised in a convoy like this if it was about the working class truckers. But in reality, what you are seeing, the minority that are there, most of them are the actual owners of these companies mm. that mistreat their workers. So by <laughs> this idea of twisting it around and acting like this is a working class uprising, when the vast majority of the working class people support vaccines, support mandates, as well as the truckers do, is just you know absurd. David, it's so important that you highlighted that because I think that detail gets left out in much of the reporting, certainly here in the states, right? I mean, you have to do a lot of digging to figure out who's really behind this. It seems like these are just working class individuals, but it's really the employers in the trucking industry. I want to understand why. I mean, if we're dealing with folks who are unvaccinated, it is likely that if they do end up getting sick with coronavirus, well, it'll knock them out more than likely. And I don't mean they're definitely gonna die, but their symptoms are definitely gonna be more severe compared to an individual who might get a breakthrough infection, but they're vaccinated. So what is the incentive here for the employers? They're gonna lose productivity if their truckers are sick. Like, What are they trying to do here? Yeah, to be honest with you, this is a question I also struggle with because it it doesn't it makes absolutely no sense in terms of the science, in terms of how you know this this virus impacts us if we're not vaccinated. It doesn't make any sense for them to be against these vax mandates. A lot of it, though, is just they don't want any regulation at all, and this you know applies to every sector, be it how they treat their employees, be it you know a vax mandate. They don't want to have any sorts of restrictions like this, and a lot of it. I mean, we get back to the money. It's you know, it's not clear, of course, where exactly a lot of this money is coming from. They were forced to move from GoFundMe to another crowd source or crowdfunding platform where they're now taking crypto. So there's donations from you know a dollar to twenty five thousand dollars that are anonymous. So who knows where that's coming from? But there is definitely a question that. This really just appears to be a way to try and bring the anti-vax, anti-mandate sentiment and funnel these people into a more right-wing message. And that's what they, they've done with oil and gas workers in the past, the past couple of years. Very similar organizers behind, behind that kind of movement have also been behind this movement. So it seems to be a, 
this effort to really try and recruit for the right by using this anti-vax sentiment. And that was also you know, shown during the last election as well in, in Canada where there was this you know, sentiment as Americans have, the, the, the fringe of individuals that don't believe in vaccines. There was that attempt to try and grab those people and funnel them into a more right wing party in Canada being the People's Party of Canada. Oh, it's fascinating. So talk to me a little bit about what it was like to, you know, or what it has been like to experience this pandemic in Canada. Because while we talk about it on the show time to time, it's important to remind folks in this context that Canada was very different from the United States in regard to providing the social spending necessary to keep people whole as they were, you know, forced into lockdowns and all of that. So when you talk about the juxtaposition of the employers here versus the actual truckers, the workers. How do the truckers feel about the handling of the pandemic in Canada? Have they been frustrated with the government? Are they overwhelmingly you know, satisfied with how the government has handled it? Are there legitimate concerns? So there are real concerns and so this is always a, for me, this always depends on who I'm talking to. So if I'm talking to you know Americans, Canada has done a little more here in terms of taking care of the work, in terms of having a you know a sort of a well a wage subsidy for employers, but also a wage replacement if you were out of work during the pandemic and taking care of people. Of course, you have single payer healthcare, so a lot of the worry around this impacts of how the virus may impact you, a lot of those worries aren't there. But there, of course, you know there's a lack of of at home tests. There's been a lack of um, uh, contact tracing. There have been a lack of real measures put in place that would have been able to really help us even further in this pandemic. Even though you know, compare numbers to the U.S., we're doing a lot better than Americans are. But there's still a lot more that we could be doing. And also, part of the the issue here is each province deals with these public health uh, 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 issues separately. So you know, Ontario is different than BC, it's different than Alberta. So there's been a lot of a sort of a just a, a disjointed approach to handling this pandemic, and that's also has has caused you know a um, uh, an issue with our ability to to battle this pandemic as as successfully as we could have. But that said, by and large, comparing us to Americans, we are doing much better. But yes, people have issues. Of course, you know we're all tired of this this virus. We're right. all we're all pissed off, and that's why at the beginning of this convoy, it had a lot of support because people are tired of these lockdowns. They're tired of having to wear a mask. But you have to think about it for just a second. You know, pretending the virus is gone is not going to make the virus go away. We have to actually deal with it. We have to have these public measures in place to protect the most vulnerable. Even though. Yes, if you you know are healthy for the the vast majority of people, they're not going to be as impacted by the virus as somebody who's younger or older. But then just disregarding those people who may be immunocompromised, who may be more impacted by COVID nineteen, is just to me you know psychotic. We have to care about society as a whole, take care of everyone, mm-hmm. and have these public health measures in place and ensure that we are vaccinated to protect as much people as possible. Not only that, I mean, aside from immunocompromised individuals, which we should be concerned about, whenever there's a COVID spike, hospitals end up being overwhelmed with COVID patients who are unvaccinated. I know that's the case here in the United States. Are you experiencing something similar in Canada during COVID spikes? Oh yeah, especially during a, a Omicron, it was uh, it was horrible. So it's right. it's gotten better now, of course, as the wave has has uh, has gone down a bit. But yeah, we definitely dealt with that uh, here as well. Okay, uh, so. I mean, it's kind of becoming clearer and clearer what the real intentions and motivations are here. The fact that this is really a demonstration by employers rather than actual workers is an important point to make. But you know, the thing that really stands out to me is the failure of the government and law enforcement to get things under control. It's something that we see here in the United States as well. And it worries me because it shows you the vulnerability and the weakness of our institutions. And so what do you see at play in regard to law enforcement? Why have they had such a difficult time getting things under control? Honestly, because they're not indigenous protesters, they're not Black Lives Matter, they're not environmentalists. So it's not as much of an issue for them as if it were you know, one of those groups. That ultimately is the problem here. But again, that doesn't mean 
You know, this is a, an issue I struggle with as well because I don't want to encourage the police to go out there, you know, and knock some skulls. So we have to ha have a sort of um, approach here that that makes sense. But it's just to point out the hypocrisy where you know, if Indigenous protesters were in Ottawa for a week honking their horn, like this would have been over in 12 hours. Mm -hmm. The police would have been out there, would like would have arrested everybody. But it's a much different approach when it's this convoy. And that should give people pause to, to maybe realize, hey, what is this really about? And when you see like uh, swastikas flying or you see the Confederate flag there, if that appeared at a Black Lives Matter protest or a environmentalist protest or indigenous protest, that flag would be ripped away immediately. That person kicked out of that protest because they're not part of what that movement is. Yet here, they're accepted and it's fine. So you can't just say, oh, you know, one or two people are doing this. If they allow these sorts of people flying these kinds of symbols into this group, that shows you what the entire group is about. Wow, Canadian Confederates, what a sight to <laughs> see. It was right? amazing to see. Yeah, really, it's incredible. Yeah. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more, there's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR, so those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.